it's great to have you here with us as we are worshipping together, as we are giving thanks to God for all his goodness and his grace and, and joining together, keeping connected. You are most welcome. We're so thankful for you for being here from Dalkeith, from Scotland and indeed across the world. We've had folks messaging in from Scotland, but also from uh, America and from Australia as well. So we're just so thankful to have you all here today. It's great to be with you to worship our loving God, our merciful Father, and to give thanks for what Jesus has done for us. Lovely to have you join with us. And I just echo what Kay said, it's been so nice to hear how much people have enjoyed the service last week and the week before. And thank you for all your encouraging messages. And we just want to let you know about a few things before the service starts. So firstly, just to let you know about Encounter tonight. This is our first encounter online and we're really looking forward to it. So get your cup of tea and come and join us at six o'clock and you can chat with us through the service. And also today during the service, if you want to chat and interact during the service, you can use the chat facility along the bottom and we'd love to get your feedback and interact with you. And it's lovely to have you with us. So as you know, church has moved online and we're, we're playing catch up. We're trying to do all we can. And we've discovered this wonderful tool called Zoom that has, has helped us no end. We've been involved in quite a few meetings on Zoom this week. We've been really encouraging. We had our Lent Bible study, which met on Tuesday and we'll meet again this Tuesday. It will be on Zoom. We'd love you to, to take part on that. We also had our prayer meeting last Wednesday and that was on Zoom too. And it was from the, the very young, from here on my left, to the not so young. Folks in their 90s were able to, to get hold of the technology and join in. And it was a really good, exciting time together because there's real power when the people of, the people of God pray together. And so we'd invite you in, in a couple of weeks' time to join in that prayer meeting again. If maybe for the first time, we'd love you to be there to share. You don't have to, you don't have to speak. You don't even have to show your face. You can keep a, a, blank, a black screen up on, on the Zoom app. But we'd love you to, to join with us as we seek God in these times of trouble. We have been doing that, but we'd also encourage you to keep the regular rhythm of, of prayer meeting and house groups. That's what we do every two weeks. So this week is house groups week, and we'd invite you as, as house groups, you, you know who you are, to meet together online through Zoom, through Facebook, through Messenger, through Skype, however you do, we'd love you to continue to meet together. And we're a church of all ages, so some people find it more difficult to use Zoom. So maybe you're great with Zoom. Maybe you could phone up someone and include them in the Zoom meeting via the phone. Maybe you could show someone else how to do it or phone them up and chat them through it. There are lots of different ways we can help each other as a church community and lots of different ways we can help each other outside church as well. And one of the things we were thinking about on Friday, we were able to join in with an alpha online Zoom meeting. And I don't know if you're like me, a lot of people in my office at the hospital, a lot of people I meet through work, they're realizing that life is quite fragile and they have a lot of questions and alpha would be ideal for them. But how do we invite them when we can't run an alpha group? So what we're thinking is if we could do Alpha online, we're just thinking about that at the moment and praying through that as a leadership team. So watch this space. Yeah, and if you're thinking, well, how on earth do I find out all the details for this? We send out an, an email newsletter on a Monday and a Friday. We, we try to keep people connected through the email as well as on Facebook and, and the services we have. So if you're not already signed up to the email contact list that we have, please email the church office. Elaine and Sheena are working from home, but they have access to the emails and they can quite happily, and would love to put you on the email list to keep you connected. The email for the, the church is sjkpdalkeith at gmail.com. We'll put that up on the, the comment section of, of this stream as well, just so you know. I think that's everything we need to mention, isn't it? Yeah. Let's worship. Let's worship God together. Every Sunday morning we light the candle to celebrate that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. I've managed to rope in Peter to light the candle for me. So he's holding the candle and I'm going to give it a light. So let's light the candle together. 
we celebrate that Jesus Christ is the light of the world and in him there is no darkness.
everyone. How are you doing? It's been a week since my last message and a week since we last uh, got together like this. Um, but I was wondering how your week's been. And I think for some of you, the week will have been really special. And for other people, the week will have maybe been a bit boring or you may be a bit fed up with staying indoors now. Um, but special times happen, don't they? Even when we're in times of lockdown. Even when we're in times where we can't see each other as much or we can't get together with our friends and family as much and we can't do some of the celebrations that we used to. For example, I bet that some of you have had birthday celebrations in the last few weeks. Um, and I know that some of the children at St John's and King's Park have had their birthdays recently. Um, Sky and Zara, happy birthday girls. I know you've both celebrated your birthday recently, but I bet there's lots of you throughout Dalkeith and Newton and Dander Hall and Miller Hill and Shaw Fair and all our surrounding areas that have had lots of birthdays this week and last week. And I bet it's been a bit different, your celebrations, haven't they? They won't have had the usual parties and family get togethers that you've maybe had and it's had to be done differently. But I'm sure you've all found really exciting and new ways of celebrating your special times together. Well, in the Bible, we've got some really special times as well, and particularly at this time of year. For example, today is a really special Sunday. Today is Palm Sunday. And I wonder if you know what Palm Sunday is all about. Does anyone know what Palm Sunday is? Well, Palm Sunday is the day that marks the start of our Holy Week. And Holy Week is when we have our whole week running up to Easter Sunday next week. And I'll tell you about Easter Sunday next week when we get together. But it's a really special day when Jesus rose again from the dead. So this week is Palm Sunday. Now, Jesus came into Jerusalem, which was the, the main city where he lived. And he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. He didn't go there on a big fancy horse. He didn't go there having told the world this is what he was doing. But he went there to see the people and to tell them about God's love. The interesting thing about it is that the Bible had been telling people for years and years and years that a man would come, a king would come, riding on a donkey and tell everyone of God's love. And that's what he did. He found a donkey tied up nearby and he rode into town on a donkey. And there was lots and lots and lots of people there and lots of people waving palm branches. Palm branches came from the trees that grew in the area. And palm branches are waved, and we, that's why we call it Palm Sunday, because they waved the branches and they put them down for the donkey to walk on as he came into town. You can make some palm branches, and after we've listened to this talk, I've connected a little video that will hopefully show you how to make some palm branches while you're stuck at home. And you can have your own little reenactment of, of palm branches and, and play with it. But people were trying to figure out who he was as well. There was lots of people gathered together. But not everybody knew who he was and the word was spreading round quite quickly about who he was. Now, can you imagine that must have been quite difficult because in those days there wasn't any computers like I'm speaking to you now. There wasn't any television to tell everybody the news. There wasn't even really newspapers or anything like that where people had notices up and told everybody about what was happening. So the news that Jesus was coming into Jerusalem on a donkey was because the Bible had said so. And because people had heard about this amazing man called Jesus, who'd been travelling all over Israel, helping people, 
performing miracles, sharing God's love and telling them all about the amazing things that God the Father had in store for them. And people gathered more and more and more because they wanted to hear about these amazing things and see about all the stuff that was finally coming true. So once you finish listening to this little message, maybe you could get your Bible out if you've got one at home, or you could look up the computer if you don't have a Bible, and you could read uh, the book of Matthew. And chapter 21 in the book of Matthew tells you all about Easter and Palm Sunday and running up to Easter and what it's all about and why it's so important for us as Christians and what we believe in. So have a read of that. If you can then click on one of the links that I'll attach to this video, you'll see a craft where you can make some palm branches and you can have lots of fun. And then there's also a link to a worship song. And I expect you all to have loads of fun singing and dancing and get your mums and dads and your brothers and sisters and everybody involved. And you can do the actions and you can sing and you can dance. So I think for the time being, I will see you again like this next week on Easter Sunday. But right now, let's pray together. So what we do normally in our church is we put our hands out, our hands up and our hands down. Father in heaven, hear our prayer on this special day. As we remember the story of Palm Sunday, may we also remember that you came to show us kindness and mercy and love. Help us, Lord, to remember to be kind in the difficult times we face at the moment and to be loving and gentle to those around us, just like you've shown us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well done. So until I can see you again like this the next time, um, have fun, stay well, stay home, be really kind to your mums and dads and to your brothers and sisters and God bless. Hi everybody. So I hope you've had a good week. We have missed you all. We look forward to when we can see you in person. And I'm just going to do the prayers. So if you want to join with me, let us pray. Father God, we give you thanks for the crowds who greeted Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem, singing glad songs of victory. We give you thanks because for our salvation, Jesus was obedient even to death on the cross. The tree of shame was made the tree of glory and where life was lost, their life has been restored. We give you thanks for your steadfast love and abundant goodness to all who wait upon the Lord. Glorious God of all, you are the giver of new life. You are the one to whom we owe each breath. You are the reason for our hope. Fill us with your spirit. Be present with us as we come close to you, seeking your light to see what has been revealed. Seeking your warmth to set hearts aglow with your love seeking your truth that we might trust. As we proclaim the Easter gospel, that in you is life which conquers death, make us anew your beloved children. We confess to you our selfishness and our lack of love. Fill us with your spirit. We confess to you our fear and failure in sharing our faith. Fill us with your spirit. We confess to you our stubbornness and our lack of trust, fill us with your spirit. And as we remember Jesus and what he did on the cross for us all, we remember him in the words he taught us as we say together, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Hi folks, well we're now at the point of our sixth week and, and kind of coming to the end of this series on how we live in 40 days of community, the irony being that we've been taken away from each other physically, but we've really been kind of mining the depths of how we can connect online and we know that there are folks who have not been able to do that, but we've been definitely thinking about other people and we've seen it and we've been delighted in it. But we are, I, I guess we just want to be together, don't we? We want to really kind of hug, kiss, welcome each other. When we get back into the physical building, what party there's going to be. But we give thanks that we can connect this way and we can share in God's word as well. So 40 days in community. Today we're thinking about how we can live a generous life. There's a story of two twins, or a pair of twins, and, and they were the exact opposite. I don't know if you've ever met twins that are just like chalk and cheese. Well, these two were. One was a pessimist and one was an optimist. Whatever they got when it came to birthdays, one was so fed up and the other one was just was just delighted with whatever they got. And so it went through all the years. Then eventually mum and dad decided to play a trick. They decided to play a trick. And so what they did was they decided to buy the twins a horse, but they would put the, the horse in the, the pessimist in his room. They would put the horse in the pessimist's room and they would do something different in the optimist's room. So they, they took the boys away. They, they got the horse in to the pessimist's room and got him ready. And they did something else into the, the optimist twins' bedroom. And so the morning came and the pessimist was shown into his room and there was this beautiful horse, gorgeous horse, beautiful horse. And he saw it and he went, oh my goodness, it's a horse. How much work is that horse going to have to take? I'm going to have to clean up after it, I'm going to have to brush it, I'm going to feed it. This is a horrible present. Then they went into the optimist's room and in the optimist's room what they'd done was they'd filled it, filled it with horse manure almost the ceiling. And the boy went, wow! And he went diving in and he started digging all the manure out of the way. And mum and dad were looking and going, what on earth is this all about? And they said, son, what, what are you doing? And he said, well, with all this horse manure in here, there's got to be a beautiful horse in here somewhere. I wonder if you're a pessimist or if you're an optimist. I wonder if, if these challenging times have really been tough for you or if they've just been something that you expected you, you knew, knew was going to happen. Well this morning I want you to know that God loves you dearly and he has given so much for you in your life sometimes that you, you don't even recognize it but as he has given to us he is calling us to live a generous life for others to, to look out for other people. So as we come to the end of the series, as we come to the beginning of Holy Week, as we celebrate today being Palm Sunday, we are going to remember what Jesus has given for us so that we can live a generous life for him. And the last six weeks have all been about how to live in community. And during this lockdown, we've been filled with fear and worry and insecurity. It's, it's hit us probably where we are most vulnerable. Our resources of time and talents and treasure have really been changed. And when usually we can cling to each other for support, in community we find peace. And that has been taken from us and it's been tough. But we know that the community remains, that church is not just a building. 
for 400 years, church didn't have a building and there was, there was amazing growth as the church went across the world. But as we remember that church is not a building, it's a people and we've been called into existence by him. He has breathed life into the church. We also need to remember that he has not left us. The word for community in the Bible, the Greek word, is koinonia. We've mentioned koinonia a few times. It's translated as fellowship, usually, but it also means different words as well. The words that have been translated can also mean participation, contribution, and generosity. And this is important because without any of these, fellowship, without participation, contribution, and generosity, community and fellowship cannot exist. For community, we all need contribution. We all need to participate and we need to be generous from you, from me, from all of the family of God. So this morning, I'm going to challenge you to think about how we live a generous life. Because without generosity, we don't get participation. We don't get contribution. We don't get fellowship. Famous psychiatrist Carl Menager said, Generosity is one of the essential components of mental health. We have found that generous people are rarely mentally ill. Wow, that's a big statement. So why does God want us to be generous? Well, we're going to look at seven reasons why God wants us to be generous. And they're, they're, if you've got the, the email sent to you, it'll be in your insert there. If you haven't got an email from the church at any point during this time, please let us know and we will get you on the email newsletter. Because what we've, we've found is that we're sending out the email to many people, but we maybe not have everyone on it. So if you're seeing this, please email the office at sjkpdalkeith at gmail.com. We can put that in, in under the comments as well. So why does God want us to be generous? Seven reasons. Number one, it creates community. 2 Corinthians 9 verses 11 and 12. Your generosity not only provides for the needs of the people, but also produces prayers of thanksgiving to God. When you give either from your talents, either from your time, either from your treasure. As you give, you build a relationship and people give thanks to God for what you do. Your heart will be where your treasure is, Matthew 6, verse 21. Where you invest, where you're giving, shows where your heart is, shows what you love, it shows where you spend your time. So, for example, where you're spending your time, your talents and your resources is what you actually love. And the different things could be your house, it could be your kids, it could be your car, it could be your hobby. Wherever your resources go, that is what you love. So when I'm generous with my resources with you, you realise that I care for you. Every time we give to God, it draws us closer to Him. Every time I give to you, it draws me closer to you. So as we give, as we share of the abundance that we have, whatever that is, it creates community because people are drawn to us as we care for them. The first Christians were famous for it. In Acts chapter 4 verse 32 it says these words, The community of believers shared everything in common. They were family. They gave where the need was. So how will you be generous in this crisis? How will you be generous for the isolated, for the ill, for the bereaved? Who will you give yours for? Or you may be one of those people who's really struggling and you don't know who to turn to. Give us a shout, let us know, so then we can make sure that you are cared for too. If you have or have had kids, do you not love it when siblings shared? when they got the idea of being unselfish, of giving from what they have to help their, their sibling, their brother or their sister. And in the same way, this is how God is. He is delighted as Father when he sees his children sharing from what he has given them. Second reason why generosity is what we need to live 
is that it defeats materialism. In this culture of materialism, when we're told it time and again that we need to have more, more and more, the only antidote, antidote is to give and not to hoard. Because when we give, it grows our hearts. It breaks the cycle of want, want, want. And it is a fantastic lesson for the young people of our church to learn too. That's why we do at Christmas time the Advent Conspiracy, because I suppose more than any other time, Christmas is the time where people just go crazy to get stuff in. To get stuff in so that they have this perfect Christmas. And yeah, the first Christmas was the baby born in a manger, in an animal feeding trough, in a stable at the back of a house. Matthew 6 verse 24 says, You cannot serve both God and money. If, if you've got your Bible or if you've got your insert there, underlying you cannot. Because you need to choose who's number one. If you need a reminder, think on this week. Think on Good Friday and what God has given for you. You cannot serve God and money. One, there has to be a decision. You have to either choose God or money. Because if you chase after the money, well, it's a... It's a dead end road, really. But if we chase after God, He will give. He will give from His stories for each one of us as we live this generous life. So it defeats materialism. It creates community. Number three, it also strengthens our faith. Second Corinthians 9 verse 13 says, Your giving proves the reality of your faith. More promises about giving are in the Bible than anything else. Why? Because God wants us to learn how to be generous. So it makes us more like Him. That's what this journey in this life is all about. This journey is all about discipleship, about becoming more like Jesus. And without Him we would have nothing anyway. He even gives us the breath in our lungs. Sooner or later we need to decide if we're going to believe in the promises of the Bible. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6 Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will reap generously. How about that one? How about that one is one of the promises of God? We know it, don't we? In every aspect of life, if we are judgmental, we, we get people being judgmental back at us. If we're critical, we receive criticism. If we gossip, we get gossip back. If we're jealous, we get other people who are jealous and envious surrounding us and creating creating a pretty miserable time for us. What you give, you get back more. And in the same way, if you give encouragement, affirmation, kindness, you will get it back in abundance. This is the way the world is. As you sow into something, you reap a harvest back. If you plant one tomato seed, you don't expect just one tomato off the tomato plant. You expect a harvest. And in the same way, if we live a life of generosity, if we are giving of encouragement and affirmation of kindness and love, we do it because of God has loved us. But as we do it, we discover that we get it back as a harvest. God says if you give, he will take care of you. Why do we need to learn this? Because our human nature is the exact opposite. Our nature is to keep it for ourselves. I mean, the, the toilet roll situation that we've had in these last few weeks is a key example of that. Someone must have started buying up toilet roll and then it snowballed. And so many others and others and others, it, it became ridiculous that, that toilet roll was the thing that we lack in, in a horrific disease, that, a horrific virus rather, that takes control of the lungs. I don't get it. But then I understand it. Because we do want to hoard, don't we? We want to keep, we want to stockpile. We want to keep it for ourselves because we are fearful and insecure. There seems to be two kinds of people in the world, givers and takers. And it's interesting because the takers are often miserable. It's no surprise that miser and miserable come from the same Greek word. Givers are the ones who don't think of themselves. On occasion, when we're on a, 
a road trip maybe up to Aberdeen to see family. We'll stop at the Burger King in Dundee. We'll stop there and we'll, we'll, we'll make sure everyone gets a meal. And the amount of times that these meals have ended up in misery, in tears, in, in, in just grumpy tempers shoot out because someone got something and someone else didn't get what they wanted. But I remember one of the one of the biggest ones was when I said to one of the, the children, I'll not mention which one, but I said, can I get a chip? And they, they lost the plot. No, you can't get my chip. You've got your own chips. You've got all your chips. You're not getting any of mine. And it was fascinating because I had simply asked for a chip. And it was like I was stealing his or hers most favourite thing. The truth is, I could have gone and bought more chips. I'd eat all my chips. But we, we didn't do that. I could have got more, but we didn't do that. I just wanted to see if they were willing to give. I'm not sure it's a lesson any of us learn. Because with our Father, He's our source for all that we have has been given by Him. And He doesn't want our stuff. He doesn't need it. But when He asks us to give, do we have a heart that is willing to give? Or do we try and keep it to ourselves? God is able to make it up to you by giving you everything you need and plenty left over to give joyfully to others. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8. God wants us to be a blessing to other people, to be givers, not takers, not to be miserable misers. I know we're going to be hit financially as a church in the next few months. And, and, and this is not a... This is not a plea for, for money, but we know that there will be tough times ahead. We know that there are going to be times where we may have to dig deep and ask you to give. But I firmly believe not in fundraising. I'm, I'm not a fan of fundraising. I'm a fan of faith raising. I believe that when people of faith see and hear God speaking and moving and see the vision that God has given them, their faith rises and they freely give after that. As we give, our faith grows. As we are people of generosity, it strengthens our faith. Number four, to live a generous life is an investment for eternity. Use your worldly resources to benefit others. In this way, your generosity stores up a reward for you in heaven. Luke 16 verse 9. You've heard it many times, there's no pockets on a shroud. All the stuff that we amass in this world, we cannot take with us, but we can pay it forward. How? By investing in the kingdom of God. By investing the time, the talents, the treasures, the shape that you and me have in our God-given life, we can invest in others. What, we have 80 years here, maybe more, maybe less, but we will have trillions in eternity. Where are you going to store up your treasure? 1 Timothy 6 verse 18 and 19 says these words. Tell the rich to use their money to do good, giving happily to those in need, always being ready to share with others whatever God has given them. By doing this, they will be storing up real treasure, real treasure for themselves in heaven the only safe investment for eternity and they will be living a fruitful Christian life down here as well. And folks, we in this country, in this part of the world, we are in the top 5% of the richest people on the planet. We definitely still have poor people here, but there are many of us who have much more than we will ever need. How about we give how about we invest? What's better to invest in than the kingdom of God? Especially at a time such as this. So it's, being generous is an investment for eternity, but also it blesses us in return. It not only creates community and defeats materialism and strengthens faith, generosity also blesses us today. Give generously and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. Deuteronomy 15 verse 10. 
But also you can look at Luke chapter 6, verse 38, Proverbs 3, verses 9 and 10, Proverbs 11, verse 25, and Psalm 112, verses 5 and 6. <coughs> These are promises that say, when we are living a generous life, God will take care of us. Do we believe it? If not, take a pair of scissors and snip those bits out of the Bible right now. We trust him for salvation, but we also are called to believe him for the promises that he will bless as we live a life for him. If we're stingy with what we have, if we hold on to our time and our talents and resources for what we want to do, we're not truly trusting God and we're missing out on what he has for us today. Number six, living a generous life produces happiness. There is much more happiness in giving than receiving. Acts 20 verse 35. I don't know if you've been doing Joe Wicks workouts this week. Uh, myself and the boys have been doing the Joe Wicks workouts and it has been killing me. I, I manage about 15 minutes and then I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I thought I was relatively fit. I'm, I'm nowhere near as fit as I thought I was. <coughs> Excuse me. And and sometimes when you do these workouts, you'll hear somebody shouting, come on, give, give, give till it hurts. But actually we as Christians are to give until it feels good. If you look at the givers and the takers, who are the happier? I believe the happiest people are the ones who are most generous, even when they don't have much to give. My experience when we went to Kenya just for a short time many years ago was that these folks were so happy that we met and they had next to nothing. And I think the stories from what I've heard from other folks who have been down to Africa who have seen real poverty are amazed by how content and how happy these people are and how when they receive something they share it with everyone they don't hold on to it. The happiest people are the most generous. Takers are too concerned losing what they have. Seventh reason. Seventh reason to be generous is it makes us more like God. We all live off God's generous bounty, gift after gift after gift. John 1 verse 16 in the message. God is generous. You know that. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. God is generous. He wants to give to us. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Giving is the essence of love and the essence of fellowship. It's interesting, in the Bible, we're called to believe 272 times. We're called to pray 371 times. We're called to love 714 times. And we have to do these things. These are key for our walk with Jesus. But interestingly, the Bible says we are to give, and mentions give, 2,162 times. I think God wants us to get this, to live a generous life. Everything we have comes from the Lord. We can only give you, Lord, what is yours already. That's from First Chronicles 29. God owns all the chips, all the Burger King fries. God has it all. He wants us, as we receive, to give freely. Because you will be glorifying God through your generous gifts. Second Corinthians 9 verse 13. There have been times when Don and I have, have spent some time in prayer and careful consideration about what we're meant to do with our time, with our resources, with our talents, the things that we have to give. And it's been fascinating how every time when we've come back together after prayer, we've received the same answer, or that we're to spend time in the same area, or that amount that we thought about is the same as each other and we are given to what God is calling us to. We want to glorify God with a generous life, with our generosity. And it's often less about what we give, it's much more about our attitude. So, in closing, how do we practice generosity? If you're really eager to give, it isn't important how much you're able to give. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 12. It's all about our hearts. What God wants us to do in them. What God wants to do in our hearts as we give. And if you want 
a verse to help you as God is speaking to you about where you're to give in this next season? Well, this is it. You must make up your own mind as to how much you should give. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves the person who gives cheerfully. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7. How do we practice generosity? Well, we're first of all thoughtful. We make up our own mind, as that verse says. We take time and we pray and we think about where God is challenging us and leading us to give. We're also to be enthusiastic, to not give out of reluctance or out of guilt, to give where we feel called to give, be that with our time, be that with our skills and gifts, be that with our financial gifts. We're also to give voluntarily. There's never any pressure. We're never to put people under pressure about where they should be given. If it's forcing them on to the, the, the rota for coffee, if it's financial, if it's we need someone to help here, you really need to do it. We don't work that way. God doesn't force us into making decisions. We are called to live a life of not putting pressure on anyone else. And I think that's a good rule for all our life. God doesn't do with us. And when we feel pressure from others, we should back off and say we're going to spend time in prayer about it. So we give, not in response to pre pressure. And then finally, for God loves the person who gives cheerfully. Cheerfully, that's how we're to give. Where we, we give where we love to see things happen. The one Greek word that is, is also translated hilarious is the one word for giving. We should be joyful. And St John's of Kings Park Church is a joyful church. We love to laugh there. We love to smile. We love to share together. Because you are a generous people. You are a generous church. And to be generous, as you are generous, joy flows out of you. You cannot have joy without giving. Remember the generosity of Jesus Christ, the Lord of us all. He was rich beyond our telling, yet he became poor for your sake, so that his poverty might make you rich. Now in this verse, 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, He's not talking about money. Paul's not talking about money. He's talking about how the God of the universe humbled himself and became a human being in that stable, lived a life of poverty, and yet he gave and he gave and he gave. He endured the trials and the tribulations of that path to the cross. He, nailed, he was nailed to the cross. He gave his life on that cross. He could have come down at any point. He is God. Yet he stayed there and he paid the price. He paid the price of sacrifice so that you and me and this whole world can come to God and know that our sins are forgiven when we enter into a relationship with him. He doesn't force his way in. We open the door as he knocks. We invite him in, and in that relationship we find that our needs are met, our worries are quelled, and he calls us to live with him. I don't know about you, but that sounds like great, great news to me. And as we celebrate today, Palm Sunday, where Jesus came in and they were all proclaiming Hosanna, Hosanna to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Probably a lot of the same people were calling crucify and spitting on him on Good Friday. God gave his all for you and me. On the cross, he calls out to you, to me, to everyone, I am doing this for you so that we can live and breathe in true freedom, so that we can go and live together in the Father's house. He's saying to you, to me, to everyone, each and every day, come to me. Open the door. 
trust in me and never forget all that I've given you. Give all you can for him. We are saved because Jesus, out of sheer generosity, moved to save us. Acts 15 verse 11. God calls us. God calls us to live a life of generosity so that we can build community, so that we can build a place that is fitting for the King of Kings. He doesn't leave us. He never forsakes us. And he calls us to live for him. So how about we do it? As we think of this Holy Week, as we think of the journey to the cross that Jesus began on Palm Sunday, as the people cried Hosanna, may we never forget what he has given for us. May we celebrate. May we sing Hosannas. When Friday comes, we will grieve. When we meet again, we will celebrate the risen King. Shall we pray together? Dear God, we know that everything we have is a gift from you. We would have nothing if you weren't generous. We know that you want us to learn to be like you. Help us to remember that every time we're generous, it creates community. It defeats materialism. It strengthens our faith. Help us to see it as an investment for eternity. Jesus, we know that we'll never be able to repay what you've done for us. But we want to learn to be generous like you, giving thoughtfully and enthusiastically and voluntarily and cheerfully. We want to live a life of thanksgiving, to give our thanks for your giving. First, we want to give you our lives. Then we want to give you back some of what you've given to us. In your name we pray. Amen. And now if you just want to join me, we're going to pray for others. Let us pray. Let us pray to the Lord, who is our refuge and stronghold, for the health and the well-being of our nation, that all who are fearful and anxious may be at peace and free from worry, for the isolated and housebound, that we may be alert to their needs and care for them in their vulnerability, for our homes and families, our schools and young people, and all who are in any kind of need or distress, for a blessing on our local community, that our neighbourhoods may be places of trust and friendship where all are known and cared for. For those who weighed down with hardship, failure or sorrow, feel that God is far from them. For those who are tempted to give up the way of the cross, that we, with those who have died in faith, may find mercy on the day of Christ. We commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of God. We lift our prayers to you, Jesus, author and perfecter of our faith. Amen.
So we have been the church gathered, we now go to be the church scattered, but we remain connected. God is with us, God is living through us, and he is calling us to live a generous life, to look out for others, to be there for others, to be generous so that we create community. Now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with each one of you and all those whom you love for this day and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen.